ready to start here. And um, it's always difficult in these um, webinars to know if, if everyone can hear us, but I'm just going to assume that that's the case. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to um, the, um, the latest in of the series of panel discussions during Constitution Month by the Montpelier Foundation. Very, very happy uh, to have you with us this evening. We are going to be talking about how Black Americans shaped our democracy. And this is one in a series of several panels that we have been presenting all month long in September to celebrate the Constitution. And I'm really, really excited about our guests. I, I must say uh, that our two guests tonight, I'll introduce them in a second, are new board members of Montpelier. We could not be more fortunate than to have them um, I'm, I feel uh, spoiled that we can um, that that we can that we're joined uh, by the talents of our two um, guests tonight on the board of Montpelier. So um, let me let's get started. And uh, for some of you, I, I'm assuming that the majority of you know about Montpelier. Um, my name is James French. I'm the chairman of the Montpelier Foundation. I've been chair since May of this year. And um, Montpelier is the plantation site of James Madison, the fourth president, the primary author of the US Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And it is also a major site of African-American history where over 300 men, women, and children were enslaved by the Madison family for over 140 years. So it's a very special, sacred place. Uh, Montpelier is located near the town of Orange in central Virginia in the Piedmont region. And Really, we think of it as the cradle of American democracy. Um, in many ways, uh, it could even be viewed as the garden of our origin story as, as Americans, the place where the father of the Constitution, James Madison, conceived the world-changing ideas that founded a new nation. And the literal, at the same time, the literal and metaphorical home of invisible founders, those enslaved here and throughout the continent with whom those ideas in the nation would not have been built. So today in our discussion, we are reaffirming those ideals and principles upon which the US Constitution is based by digging deeper into and expanding the origin story with a truer and more complete history, inclusive of all Americans. And that's really what Montpelier is, is all about. Um, we are bringing Madison's vision of democracy full circle on the same hollow ground where it was conceived. So our program tonight, Striving for Freedom, How Black Americans Shaped Our Democracy, as I said, is part of Montpelier's Constitution Month, which we've launched to commemorate the signing of the Constitution 235 years ago. You can join us all September for an on-site and virtual programming that explores the many facets of our Constitution. This evening, we'll be discussing how people of African descent helped establish the foundation for American democracy. Over the centuries, Black Americans have fought for and gained rights of citizenship, efforts which are rooted in and reaffirming of Madison's Madisonian principles. Full equality, however, still remains elusive. Historians and Montpelier board members, Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries and Dr. Leslie Alexander will be discussing how Black Americans have shaped American democracy from the writing of the Constitution through the civil rights movement. Let me introduce our guests. Dr. Leslie M. Alexander is the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Professor of History at Rutgers University and is a fellow at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at Harvard University. A specialist in, er in early African-American and African diaspora history, she's the author of African or American, Black Identity and Political Activism in New York City, 1784 to 1861, and the co-editor of three additional volumes. Her forthcoming book, Fear of, a, Fear of a Black Republic, Haiti and the Birth of Black Internationalism in the United States will be published in December. It examines how the Haitian Revolution and the emergence of Haiti as a sovereign Black nation inspired the birth of Black internationalist consciousness in the United States. Her newest project, How We Got Here, Slavery and the Making of Modern, the Modern Police State, examines how surveillance of free and enslaved Black communities in the colonial in antebellum eras laid the foundation for modern day policing. 
a recipient of several prestigious fellowships, including the Ford Foundation Senior Fellowship, Alexander is the immediate past president of the Association for the Study of Worldwide African Diaspora. Uh, uh, you may know that as Aswad, and as an executive council member of the National Council for Black Studies. Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries is the vice chairman and associate professor of history at The Ohio State University where he teaches courses on civil rights and, black power, and the Black Power Movement. In addition to his academic work, Dr. Jeffries has participated in several major public history projects and consults regularly with school districts on developing anti-racism programming. Dr. Jeffries is the author of Bloody Lounds, Civil Rights and Black Power in Alabama's Black Belt and the editor of Understanding and Teaching the Civil Rights Movement. Welcome uh, to both of you. Uh, Leslie and Hassan, we're about, we're going to have a 40 minute moderated conversation, then we'll wrap up with about 10 to 15 minutes of audience Q&A. During the Q&A, we ask that you put your questions in the chat, and when you do so, please include your name and affiliation. So, um, I'm going to just start off with a with a you know with a general uh, question and and I ask uh, you know for for whoever would like to um, uh, to come in on this. So at, at as I said at Montpelier, um, our skilled interpretive staff do an excellent job at talking about Madison's pursuit of knowledge and his intellectual engagement with Enlightenment concepts and how he translated those concepts into democratic principles such as the pursuit of liberty over tyranny government by the people and separation of powers to name but a few. These provided the foundation for our constitution and our system of government. What we don't fully explore is how black Americans were at the same time intellectualizing similar ideas about liberty and freedom and what America could look like. Can you both talk about the importance of this early black uh, political thought and how it shaped the trajectory of our nation in the following centuries? Okay, sure, I'll go first. Um, thank you so much for having us and um, thank you to the audience for coming this evening. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, you know, it's funny because when I was thinking about this conversation that we are gonna be having tonight, a concept that kept coming to me over and over again, especially when I was reflecting on the enlightenment, on natural rights philosophy, on um, James Madison's philosophy, as you said, these ideas that became the founding principle of um, this nation. What kept coming back to me is that in some ways, if you wanna think about enslaved and free black people during the revolutionary and antebellum era, they are kind of quintessential Madisonians, right? Um, they are actually people who believe in these fundamental foundational ideas, perhaps to, in some ways, even more than the founding fathers themselves. Um, to take just a step back for a minute and think about um, enlightenment philosophy and what those ideas were really about. For people who are not necessarily as familiar, what is happening during this period, you have political philosophers and political thinkers like James Madison, who are taking sort of physical principles, right? They're taking the idea that the universe and the world operate according to a certain set of sort of fundamental, natural, physical truths. And they're applying that to human beings and essentially saying, well, if there's a set of rules that govern the earth, right? There's gravity, so what goes up has to come down, right? <laughs> so if we believe that the world and the universe are governed by a certain set of natural physical laws, isn't it possible that human beings are also governed by a set of natural um, and perhaps even physical laws? And of course, this becomes the foundation of natural rights philosophy, which then ultimately becomes the foundation of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, right? All of these um, founding documents. But they are grounded in this core idea that all human beings are born with a set of fundamental inalienable rights, right? And um, and of course, as we you know learned all the way back in elementary school, right? Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so this idea that people have a fundamental right to life, and more importantly, a fundamental right to liberty, 
this is really what drove um, someone like James Madison, right? The idea that liberty is the most fundamental right that a human being has. These were, of course, principles that enslaved and free Black folks, right, in what was becoming the United States, also believed um, and also embraced these ideas. The problem, of course, was that James Madison and the other founding fathers had not yet fully expanded the idea of who these fundamental natural rights ought to be applied to. And so even though they're talking about these ideas as human, fundamental human rights, that all people are born with these uh, fundamental rights, they had not yet fully obviously extended these ideas to the indigenous Native American population. They had not extended them to people of African descent. They had not extended them to women. And I think it's important they had to acknowledge that they hadn't even yet extended these ideas to poor white people, right? That these founding political principles that shaped um, what becomes early America, the early United States, were really limited and narrow in their scope in the sense that they were really only applied to property owning, elite, literate white men. And so what enslaved and free black folks are doing, and of course later followed by women and other marginalized groups, they're essentially drawing upon these core ideas and challenging people who claim to believe in democracy to simply expand those ideas um, to the rest of the human population as well. And so that's part of the reason why initially I said, if we wanna really honestly think about it, enslaved and free black folks are kind of the quintessential Madisonians, right? In the sense that they believe in the human, right? The, the universal human right to liberty and life um, in ways that the founding fathers were not fully yet ready to grasp. Yeah, you know, I mean, Leslie lays it out wonderfully, the framing that we need to um, take with us um, to sort of understanding the, the African Americans, people of African descent, their, um, their vision for what um, this, this, this nation um, ought to be. Um, Madison absolutely believed in democracy. He just didn't believe in it for everybody, right? And so what we have to, I, I think it's important to put you know, sort of his vision, and, and by him, I also mean the founders and the framers and, and the like, into conversation, right, with the vision of an understanding of African-Americans. And in that moment in time, I mean, one of the things that we need to do and I, and I think what, what we try to do as historians of the African-American experience is we need to take African-Americans seriously as political thinkers, right? We need to take enslaved people seriously as political thinkers. Not only those who you know, have the, the, the fortune of being able to put their ideas down on paper, um, the Frederick Douglasses and the like, uh, but even those enslaved folk uh, who you know, who are denied literacy, they too, we need to take seriously as political thinkers. Nobody had a better understanding of what natural rights were, what it meant to be free than enslaved folk who are living their entire lives at this point, many of whom are living their entire lives in bondage, but living it in the presence of people who enjoy freedom, right? I mean, so it's not just Madison at Montpelier Right, who understands what freedom ought to be. It's also all the people who aren't free, right? Who are looking and observing, right? And saying like, okay, like I get this. Like I know what it is, right? It's, it's all the things that I can't do that I'm seeing him do, right? That I'm seeing these other white folk do, right? Like I get that. So that's one thing. Experientially, if we take African-Americans seriously as political thinkers in this moment in time, we will understand that they had a very clear idea of this idea of natural rights, right? This idea of what, 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 sh what should government look like and, and how could we be participants? And after, and I know we'll talk about this a little bit later, this is why the post-emancipation period is so critically important to look at because that's the moment where African-Americans are actualizing all these intergenerational ideas, right? Because they finally get the space in mass to put into action everything that they have been thinking about before. 
So, but these are new ideas in 1865. They're not fun, you know, finally saying, huh, I wonder what, you know, good, I wonder what uh, this nation, this government should actually look like. No, they're drawing on those experiences, one. But then we also have to remember, I think, that they're also drawing on their cultural traditions, right? They're drawing on the West African traditions, right? That that have a that, that provide a clear sense of right and wrong, that provide a clear sense of how people should be treated, right? As human beings and not as property. And so all of that is on the table. And we need to take seriously when as 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 as, as framing and shaping uh, how African Americans understand. Uh, what would become this American experiment? Let me let me ask a, a follow up, if I may. This is this is really fascinating how you have framed this. Um, Matt, uh, Montpelier is a is a museum, and with a museum, we're very at a museum, we're very serious about the study of history and its interpretation. As historians, how do you see what are the challenges in in interpreting? What I'm hearing you say is almost a struggle of ideas. So you have ideas that have been um, that have been that are being kind of uh, debated amongst the majority of white people about the Enlightenment, but contributions by enslaved people as full political actors. What are the, what are the challenges that historians have in discovering that uh, and interpreting that that interchange? Yeah. Well, I, I'll start, Leslie, and then, and then hand hand off to you, um, because hopefully one of the things that that, that you will talk about um, is you know, you know black political thought put down in paper, thinking about the black conventions and the black newspapers. I mean, so there is a there's a rich discourse covering a, an extended period of time pre emancipation where African Americans are exchanging ideas, right? I mean, so we can literally look to in a very broad way, sort of the written word for, for understanding the African-American experience. But I would say some of the challenges are most Black folk, right, don't have access to, um, don't have access to putting their thoughts down on paper. But most white people don't either, right? Like we're talking about Madison and Jefferson and all these guys, right? That's like four people, right? We're not talking about, you know, the, the, the most white folk who are marginalized, right? Who can't put, don't have property and all these other things. Certainly, we're excluding women. So, 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 what we're saying is here: you have a group of people, a, a slice, a large slice segment of the population, and that aren't able to put their ideas and thoughts down on paper. So, then, how can we make sense of them, right? So, in one of the challenges, and this is the first thing we got to take them seriously, right? Because we got to say, okay, I know they're thinking. Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, too often we've been like, I oh, ain't thinking, they just going through, they just suffering. Like, no, 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 stop with the suffering all the time, right? They're thinking even while they're suffering. So one of the challenges when you don't have the ease, the, the convenience of written documents is you have to read backwards, right? So, so in other words, this is why in part I'm saying that post-emancipation period is so critical because you're reading not only what people are putting down on paper. And again, we do have some written records. So let's not pretend that we don't. But then you're also reading actions and behavior and you're reading it backwards, right? You're saying, okay, they're doing this now because they were thinking about this then. Versus, you know, when we, th when we think about a Madison, we're, 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 we're reading Madison in a moment and then interpreting him forward, right? So we're like, oh, okay, we have the written word and then how does this play out? And so that, that's the convenience of having that written document because you're always looking forward. Oh, it's down on paper, so this is what they're thinking ahead about versus doing the opposite. And then of course at Montpelier, you do the wonderful uh, and rich archeological work, right? Of reconstructing um, through, the, through the, the material culture of African-Americans, not just how they were living, but in looking at how they were living, we can tell a whole lot about what they were thinking about as they were living, right? Like why do, you know, why would an enslaved person in the slave community hang on to a pipe that that has that you know that that says liberty on it, right? Like like okay, they're thinking about that. That's not an accident. Why would uh, an enslaved African woman uh, hold on to a ring uh, and pass that down through two generations? Because that's saying something about 
her understanding of her own humanity and the humanity of the people she came from and the people who would be her offspring. That's natural rights, right? I mean, that is this idea of God-given rights that says that my personhood should be cherished as should my daughters, as should my granddaughters after that. And so there are real challenges, but they are not so much so that we can't get at what African-Americans, not just were doing, but also thinking. Leslie, let me ask you a related question, if I may. So, um, you know, you, you've actually, um, you've done, both of you have done a great job at uh, giving us a better understanding of early Black political thought and the challenges to our witnessing that, uh, the expression of that thought through um, an unequal historical record. Uh, Leslie, can you talk a little bit more about how Black Americans acted upon and reified Madisonian visions of freedom that existed before emancipation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it is really important um, to take to start by just taking a moment to underscore a point that Hassan made a few minutes ago that I think is really vital to this conversation, which is that one of the biggest challenges that we face is that people are still hesitant to embrace the idea that Pe that Black people in the colonial, revolutionary, and antebellum eras could have actually been political thinkers. Um, and I think it's important to keep in mind that enslaved people were political thinkers and they made conscious, intentional, very purposeful um, political choices um, in their everyday lives and sometimes in big ways. Um, and so one of the things that we have, and I'm glad that you asked this question in particular about um, sort of Madisonian um, ideas of political philosophy, is to think about, in some cases, a literal paper trail that enslaved people left for us to let us know what their political thought um, during this period centered on. So one of the things that, you know, always fascinates me about um, James Madison was that obviously he was a, you know, extremely dedicated to um, the Constitution. He was a little hesitant about the Bill of Rights, um, not because he didn't think that the Bill of Rights should be, um, you know, should exist, but because he was concerned that the Bill of Rights was actually going to function to limit people's rights rather than expand them. And so he was heavily invested in the word choice um, and the language that should be used in the Bill of Rights can, to guarantee a certain set of fundamental human freedoms that he believed um, people should have. He was particularly attached to the First Amendment. And of course, we write a lot um, and we, we have read and you know have seen a lot about his commitment to um, freedom of religion, which is obviously protected by the First Amendment. But he was equally committed to the idea of freedom of speech and freedom of political speech. And he was particularly concerned about the freedom of the press and the right that all people should have to petition, um, particularly for redress of grievances. And I highlight those in particular because Madison really believed that the freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of the right to petition were what he described as the great bulwark of liberty. That these were the, among the most important manifestations of people's liberties and of their political freedoms. And what's interesting is that Black activists, starting in the revolutionary period, but certainly continuing through um, the 19th century, used those particular strategies in particular to advocate for their own freedom. In the revolutionary period in particular, we really see um, enslaved and free Black folks using the right to petition um, as a way to advocate for their right to freedom. So if you look at documents um, coming into newly forming state legislatures, particularly in the North, um, because Northern legislatures, legislatures had not imposed limits on who could submit um, petitions for um, a redress for grievance, you see um, legislatures being overrun with petitions coming from enslaved and free Black folks asking for various things, asking for freedom, asking for reparations, in some cases even asking to be returned to Africa. 
um, but certainly asking um, for their right to freedom and drawing very specifically on the language of the Declaration of Independence, on natural rights philosophy. They certainly didn't need natural rights philosophy, the Enlightenment, the Declaration of Independence to convince them that they wanted freedom. But what those documents did was give them a language they could use to argue for their freedom. And so petitioning was a strategy that they used regularly um, during the revolutionary era. And it's actually a strategy that they used well through um, the 19th century. And I'm sure Hassan can talk about how that continued to manifest in the 20th century um, as well. The court systems they used in a variety of ways, right? So they petitioned for their freedom, but they actually sued for their freedom um, using the courts as um, a strategy to um, fight for emancipation. And then, of course, they also exercised their fundamental right to peaceful assembly um, and used that as a way to um, hold parades through city streets um, demanding freedom, um, using peaceful assembly in a variety of ways to agitate um, on behalf of abolition. And of course, as Hassan pointed out a, a few moments ago, in the 19th century, um, beginning in the late 1820s, Black people start using the power of the press. Um, and um, Black newspapers, Black pamphlets, um, what were referred to in the 19th century as broadsides, which are kind of flyers um, being circulated, particularly in urban areas. Um, Black folks are using the, the power of the press and freedom of speech to articulate um, their desire and their right to freedom. And of course, in that regard, they're sort of, again, sort of embracing um, concepts that were really near and dear to, to Madison's heart. Thank you. Yeah. And James, if I may, just, just Absolutely. add Please. as well. I mean, there also, we also see plenty of examples of this predating Madison's Bill of Rights, right? I mean, so you think about the petitions, not only for freedom, but then also for redress. And of course, the, you know, the mum vet in Massachusetts, right? Yes. Who's going to the state, you know, the state legislature is like, um, dude owes me, right? Uh, yes. For all of these and wins, right? Now, you know, whether or not they actually, you know, the, the checks are actually cut is, you know, that's always a separate issue. But, you know, this is predated. So it's, it's, it's not like Black folk were waiting around for Madison to put this on paper to be like, yeah, I think that is a good idea. Um, Leslie's point is so critically important. It's like, but once it's on paper, right, then the language, then mm -hmm. the, the language is provided. Like we can point to this and say, aha, you put this down. And that's done throughout. So whether it's the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution or the Bill of Rights, it's like, look, you said it, you can't take it back. We're going to use it. But that doesn't, but sometimes that gets twisted, right? It's like, oh, Black folk were either waiting for this and this was the inspiration for the ideas. No, hold on, hold on. It's the use of the language of the majority society, dominant society to say, aha, this is what you're saying. And now we're going to hold you accountable to what you have said, right? And we're going to use the mechanisms that are available to us. But these are also building on things that we have been thinking about and doing even in advance of it being put down in these particular ways. You know, that's a great point. And that reminds me of a, a, a panel we had just the other day uh, over the weekend about the Constitution, in which um, one of the panelists mentioned that, you know, the Constitution kind of sat upon a larger, um, if you will, a platform of the democratic spirit of the people. And it was kind of a, an expression of that spirit. And if you will, the, the you know the, the spirit was larger than the constitution, and 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 so when it was when these concepts were written down in each era, they were interpreted differently by the population up until this very day. But what I'm what what it really what what both of you just said is fascinating because it reminds me um, of two things. One is that there are Native American um, interpretations of uh, federations and uh, democratic debate and consensus that I think informed some of, of the early debate about um, uh, the, 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 uh, some of the early debates amongst the founders. But also, uh, Leslie, I'm sure, and it, we'll get into this later, that, that there was communication amongst different groups of enslaved people about political ideas. I'm thinking in particular from places like Haiti. Um, that that people were motivated to actually, uh, and you know, hearing about de uh, developments uh, in the Atlantic world about how democracy is being enshrined in one place versus another, 
that changed um, the, the, um, the motivations and the urgency, if you will, uh, for Black people to, to claim uh, their, their, their part of the story. Um, so I'd, I'd be interested in hearing you, uh, you know, as we go along, talk a little bit about those, those um, networks of communication as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just I can say something just very quickly. I know we'll delve into this more um, in a few minutes, but I think this is one of the really exciting directions um, that historical research in this period is, is going right now, which is to really better understand the vast network of communication that's taking place you know, throughout the Americas as well as across the Atlantic world. And in many cases, it's enslaved and free black folks who are carrying that information, right? Folks who are um, enslaved or who are working for a wage on ships um, traveling across the Americas from the United States to the Caribbean, over to Europe, um, right, who are, who are moving across the Atlantic world and landing in ports where they're coming into contact with other enslaved and free Black folks, and they are all exchanging information, right? So in the 21st century, we feel really proud of ourselves for having Twitter and Instagram, and, right, all these forms of social media that allow us to communicate with each other, but we have to give credit to folks in um, you know, the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries who are transmitting detailed, um, really important news um, across the Atlantic world to each other um, and are using that to um, fuel their um, strivings for freedom. And, and, and scaring the hell out of white people in the process. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's that's shook, right? 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 Yeah. It's like, please don't bring any more Negroes over here, right? Let me right. <laughs> That's part of that's part of what he's saying. He's like this, you know, this, 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 there's a world, there's a network, and we this, this flow of ideas. They're, they're able to make themselves right. I mean, there's an interesting psychology going on, right, among enslavers here, right, and not just in the United States, but generally, right. It's like our enslaved people, right, like we're okay with them, right, like they don't want rebellion, right. They're not thinking about freedom, right. It's always it's it's always the exposure to somebody else, right? Like you know, Madison writes about this, right? Like so so and so, you know, he's been spoiled by by these ideas of freedom that you know, as he's been listening uh, while I've been here in Philadelphia, right? But, uh, think about that since day one, right? And so, but we see that, right? They're they're worried that the spread of ideas will impact and infect, right? They're on, not too late, yeah. too late, my friend, right? It's already homegrown, right? You don't need the outside agitator, but it's always the fear of like these thoughts are, these thoughts are out there, we admit, but they're only out there, like, no, 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 they are everywhere. And then the dialogue, the exchange of ideas and how to, how to execute it, what's possible, that is what's, that's what we're seeing being exchanged. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, and the language that you just mentioned is, I'm sorry, James, but just really quickly, the language that you just referred to, I think is really um, revealing that when you look at the writings of the founding fathers um, during this time, they, are, they describe it as a contagion, an infection, right? They describe it literally as sort of a cancerous disease, right? Um, that they are concerned is going to spread between the states, that is going to spread from um, other parts of the Americas, from the Caribbean um, into the United States. So they see the um, desire for liberty and for freedom among Black folks as a disease, as a contagion, as an infection that had to be contained, um, while they're very much championing it for themselves, right? When um, when Black folks are calling for the same, for the extension of the same ideas, that becomes a very threatening um, contagion that they feel they have to suppress. Well, this is a, a, a revolutionary period, and um, these are very strong ideas that are being um, traded back and forth across the Atlantic at a time where uh, there was a paradox uh, at play, which we have, you know, living side by side ideas of liberty, but also in a context of a, an economy that was bound up with slavery. And um, I, I I would, uh, why don't we go a little bit further into this uh, and dig a little bit deeper. And so Leslie, you've, you've provided us with a good sense of kind of how black Americans were intellectualizing and acting upon these ideas and communicating across borders and uh, throughout the Americas. So let's go into what was happening in America a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, more in detail. 
So what was happening in America was only part of the, the larger uh, story of the spread of democracy in the, in the uh, Atlantic world. And I'm referring specifically to Haiti and the Haitian Revolution, which had ramifications, huge ramifications on America. And this is something you've explored in depth in your new book, Fear of a Black Republic, Haiti and the Birth of Black Internationalism in the United States. Those two stories examined side by side depict conflicting narratives of freedom. We've touched upon that, but I was wondering if you what if you could just help us understand what can we learn about the struggle for freedom here in America by looking at what happened in Haiti? Right. I think that's a great question. And I think that I think the biggest thing that we can learn um, goes back to a point I was making a little bit earlier, which is that unfortunately, the founding fathers, although they had wonderful ideas, right, about natural rights, about the, the rights that all human beings should fundamentally have, they had an extremely narrow idea of who those, um, who those philosophies, who those rights, who those ideas should actually be applied to. Um, and what it really meant is that it applied to people who were exactly like them. Again, elite, wealthy, land property owning, um, white men and anyone who did not fall into that category, um, whether it be poor whites, whether it be women, um, indigenous people, um, or, or people of African descent, they were not prepared to extend that, those ideas more broadly. And so what that meant is that when movements for freedom happen in other parts of the Americas or even within the boundaries of the United States that involve people that they are not imagining as part of the human family and therefore entitled to the same rights as themselves, they become very fearful um, about what that might look like. As I imagine many of um, the people in the audience are aware, they immediately following the American Revolution, they become involved in putting down um, rebellions that are taking place among poor whites um, who are agitating for the extension of more rights um, within the boundaries of the United States. But when what becomes the Haitian Revolution pops off, right, in what was then the, the French colony of Saint-Domingue and goes from being a revolt to a rebellion, to eventually a revolution. Can you, yes. hey, Leslie, can you just give us the time frame? So for, for those in the audience who sure, are not sorry. familiar with this history? Yeah, so we're talking about 1791 um, is when the initial revolt that becomes the, um, the Haitian Revolution begins. Um, it starts actually a, as part of a, a meeting that's also a spiritual ceremony um, in the northern part of what is now Haiti, what again then was the French colony of Saint-Domingue. It begins in August of 1791. And what's actually interesting, again, is because of the flow of information, the founding fathers do, you know, political leaders in the United States do find out about um, the revolt relatively early on. They're writing and discussing it in sort of passing terms by September, right? So within a few weeks, they know it's happening. They, you know, are discussing it to some degree, but they don't become really panicked until maybe like December, right? Or early January, when it becomes clear that this is not just another uprising, this is not just another slave revolt, right? That had been taking place all across the Americas and within the United States up to this point, it's actually becoming sort of an unstoppable um, rebellion. It's reaching to 12,000, 20,000. Historians now estimate that before the revolution came to an end, there were 80,000 rebels um, involved in what becomes the revolution. So when it becomes clear that this is really becoming an unstoppable force, what it does is raise the contradiction, right? The United States was very excited about its own revolution, <laughs> right? And its own um, movement for freedom. They were very enthusiastic about the ideals of liberty and brotherhood and equality and freedom and all of these, you know, beautiful concepts. But when enslaved Africans are raising those same ideals, right? Um, again, drawing upon the language of the American Revolution, drawing upon the language of the French Revolution, using that language to support their own desire, right? Their own bid for freedom, all of a sudden, right? 
the founding fathers who have been spending decades <laughs> advocating for these ideas of liberty all of a sudden be, become very uncomfortable, right? Um, they end up sending money and various kinds of support to the French to try to put um, the rebellion down. They no longer universally support um, bids for liberty. And so what, what ends up evolving is this really kind of complicated, um, contradictory moment where the United States has just thrown off the shackles of a foreign colonizer, um, celebrating their own liberty, celebrating their own uh, independence, establishing themselves as the first, you know, independent republic in the Americas, urging other nations, you know, to do the same. And when the same thing starts to happen in San Domingue, um, they realize, right, that they don't, they cannot allow the second independent free republic um, to manifest in the Americas that is a black republic. Um, and of course, that's where I sort of, you know, riff on public enemy and, you know, the title is fear of a black republic. It's like in the United States, they cannot allow the idea that an independent sovereign black nation um, could come into being in the Americas alongside the United States. And so again, the point here is that there's a fundamental contradiction, right? Where they believe in these democratic ideals, but have a very narrow idea of um, who they should apply to. And when enslaved people in Saint-Domingue rise up and are actually using the same language that supported the American Revolution, asking for their own freedom, asking for freedom from foreign power, right? Wanting to be um, freed from colonization and to be able to establish themselves as a sovereign nation, the United States um, cannot allow that to come into being simply and only because it is a nation that is founded by formerly enslaved Black people. And there we see the fundamental limitation of these democratic ideals. So thank you. And I, I want to move further down and in, in, in further uh, down our, our, our history uh, towards some uh, the er the era that uh, Hassan is is um, most familiar with, and Hassan, I don't want to cut you off. I just want to simply say, what has also always fascinated me about Haiti is that Haitians were firm believers in Madisonian principles, principles yeah. to the extent where Haitians themselves, there were battalions of Haitians who fought in the American Revolution. Yes. Uh, I believe they were in South Carolina, and um, they fought on the side of the Amer the Patriots, yes. and um, they were inspired by Madison's very words, and then then later by the French uh, the Declaration of the Rights of Man, and amazingly, over uh, fought off three European armies that were sent to to uh to put yes. them down the, not just the french but the french the british and the spanish and won each time and were able against all odds to establish the second democratic republic in the americas it's just incredibly fascinating it inspiring. is and just very quickly i know we want to move on to the post-emancipation era but just really quickly uh, what's fascinating is that black activists in the 19th century made the exact same point that you just made right um, when arguing that the United States needed to acknowledge Haiti as a sovereign nation, that they needed to extend diplomatic relations, that they needed to change its foreign policy towards Haiti to allow Haiti to thrive as a sovereign nation, they pointed to the exact point that you just made, James, and essentially said, look, the United States would not exist as an independent nation had not these Black people from Saint-Domingue come over in troops and fought for United States freedom, right? Um, had they not fought in the Battle of Orleans, had they not fought in all of these, these, um, these conflicts that radically turned the tide of the American Revolution, the United States would not have become an independent nation. And so Black activists in the 19th century are saying, how can you have the audacity, right, to deny the, the freedom and the, and the sovereignty of a nation that, um, that you would not exist without? Which, which I think, and, and I mean, you know, look, 
20th, 20th century. We'll get there eventually. We may have to have a part two. But you know, when we think about the, the question then is why? Like, why do you deny it? And I, the obvious answer, of course, is a deep belief in white supremacy. But, but, but clearly it's because there's still, America's still deeply invested in the institution of slavery, right? And so this, which is obvious to all of us, but this is why when people say, look, we got to take seriously 1619, not just the date, but what it represents. In other words, taking seriously the ways in which an American commitment and investment in the institution of slavery up to the revolution and then beyond for almost a century, right, shapes the course of America's trajectory. You just laid out, Leslie, beautifully, like why Haiti and that revolution looks like this revolution and, and the U.S. should have been like, oh, yeah, we're all in with that. But why can't they? Because they're still all in on the institution of slavery, right? Like Madison himself, he ain't freeing nobody, right? So everything that they be talking about, he's like, no, 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 we're still, we're still holding on to this. And so that, that, I mean, I think that just speaks to, on another level, why we, in, in looking at this American experiment, right, and, and, and in democracy, we have to look at it from different angles and different perspectives to see why was it still so limited, right? Like why are the words so rich, but the action so few, right? And it has everything to do with wanting to preserve the institution of slavery. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, sorry, <laughs> don't you wanna move on, but I just have to say really no, quickly. Please go ahead, this is great. This is a great it discussion. Is, it is, I love what you just said, Hassan. And I just wanna add on that it's about a commitment to preserving the institution of slavery, despite the fact that they know that it is a thoroughly immoral and fundamentally problematic institution. I realize we're here, you know, talking about Montpelier and James Madison, but I have to just say something quickly about Thomas Jefferson, um, which is that, you know, one of, I think the most powerful um, quotes of his is where he's talking about the institution of slavery and he describes it as having a wolf by the ears, right? That moral law would demand that we let it go, right? But we can't, right? That our self-preservation requires that we cling to this thing. Mm. And what he's essentially saying is, you know, we know that what we're doing is morally wrong. You know, we know this goes against the law of God and goes against everything that is humane and just. And yet we believe that our own self-preservation demands that we cling to this thing, right? And they're holding on to it for their, their self-preservation is caught up in it economically, first and foremost, but also socially, also politically, right? They're just holding on to this thing that they know is disastrous in every way. And yet they, they are thoroughly unwilling to let it go, even though they know that it flies in the face of what is moral and just. And as Hassan was pointing out, it then puts them in this impossible intellectual political conundrum, right? Where on the one hand, they want to champion these ideas of liberty and justice and equality and freedom for themselves, but withhold it from Black people, right? Knowing that that's the wrong thing to do, knowing that on some level it's indefensible, and yet they paint themselves into a corner and force themselves into a situation where they are forced to defend something that they know is really indefensible because they imagine that their own self-preservation demands that they do. They, they, they came up short. They came up short then. And I think it is important that we acknowledge that and recognize that, but we don't. We look back and try to rationalize that, that, that away. I'm right? saying, oh, they were just men at their times, right? Like, no, 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 they knew what they were doing. They knew they were coming up short, but to make us feel more comfortable in the present, we then add that caveat. Well, you know, everybody was doing it, right? I guess, and they were men at men of their times. Oh, no, 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 let, 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 let's understand, right? Like you got Haiti over there, they're men of their times too, and the women of their times. And they're saying that that's wrong. It can be done differently. Yeah. Yeah, my response to that is always, you know, William Lloyd Garrison and John Brown were also men of their times. <laughs> and yet they made very different political decisions. Yeah. And so is George Wythe, who, who, who we heard uh, a founder the other day, a point was yeah. made. He, 
freed all of his slaves, then signed the Declaration of Independence. Yeah. He was a man of his time. Yeah. Um, so this is really, you know, Hassan, you you may be right. We have just a little under ten minutes, and we may have to to do a part two to get to uh, post reconstruction. Um, the Haitian Revolution is is fertile territory. One one last thing I would say about it, and Leslie, you can maybe talk about it, is that it is literally responsible. That revolution is responsible for the doubling of the size of our country, and um, for opening up the you know the the, the cotton economy uh, to to America, which followed that, and um, had just absolutely absolutely um, transformational um, impact on, on, on our history. And as a museum, again, I'm always interested in history. It's interesting how we know so little as a country about the relationship between these two countries and these two republics. Yes, no, I totally agree. It's always, you know, one of the things I, I like, you know, I like to do things with my, <laughs> play with my students' minds a little bit sometimes in, in class, you know, shake them up a little bit, you know, and challenge them to think about something a different way. And usually when I'm teaching about the Louisiana Purchase, which is what you're, you're talking about, um, James, I'll say to them, so, you know, the Louisiana Purchase happens in 1803. Why does it happen? And my students are looking at me like, what do you mean? You know, and I'm like, well, why does the Louisiana Purchase happen? Like, who owns that land, right? Where does it come from? Finally, someone usually like acknowledges that the French had, you know, had control over that territory. And so my question is, so why do the French, that's a nice tract of land, <laughs> right? Why does France decide to sell that territory to the United States? Why do they want to do it? their faces, like, that is not, they have learned about the Louisiana Purchase since elementary school. And no one has ever thought to ask the question, why do the French do it, right? Why did they sell this massive tract of land? Why would they do it? The reason they're doing it is because uh, exactly of what you just said, James, right? They are in a financial position as the result of fighting the Haitian revolution and losing that they have to raise money, right? To try to continue to fight the fight. They are losing all of the profits that they had been getting from enslavement in Saint-Domingue and they have been fighting a very expensive and costly war for over a decade and losing badly. And so they are strapped. <laughs> right? The only way to try to keep that fight going is to sell off some of their territories. And so, yes, as a result of that, actually the size of the United States almost triples as the result of the Louisiana Purchase. And had it not been for the revolution in Saint-Domingue, mm -hmm. and had it not been for the fact that the rebels actually win that conflict, the Louisiana Purchase never would have happened, and the United States never would have became what it did. Never right. would have become what it did. Well, thank you, Leslie. We, we're. I mean, this is a great conversation, and um, I, I always find these these conversations hard to to limit. I hate being in that position because they're so rich. <laughs> but I did want to give time for some audience questions um, before we 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 wrap up. And I also apologize to you, Hassan, if we're to stick within our our hour limit. Uh, we, we, we're time challenged. So I, I'm going to ask uh, that we do a part two if you're willing to do that. Yeah, no, 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 for sure, for sure. If, if, if I'm I always happy to get on another panel with Hassan anytime. Exactly, well, so far. <laughs> I, I was thinking too that we may have, we may have forgotten the significance of the Haitian Revolution as uh, not only for the, the, the impact that we'll have on sort of American expansionism, expansion right but then also just the ideas of freedom that are inherent in its existence and its founding but mm -hmm. we, today but in 1917 right so we're talking about over a century after it occurred the NAACP holds uh, its silent march protesting lynching and racial terrorism in the United States 10,000 black folk walking silently down Fifth Avenue in New York and at the head of the march there were four flags there was the American flag, the ideals of American freedom and constitution, Bill of Rights. There was the flag of Britain. This is, look, they're doing a little better than we're doing over here, right? So we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna, this is where it started. 
Liberia. We got a Madison connection there. Not for the reasons that Madison wanted it, right? But for this <laughs> idea, the, the connection to Africa and what we're going to do. And, you know, there's some liberty there. We can work that out. And then the fourth flag was Haiti. The fourth flag was the Haitian flag. Why? Because of the revolution and what that represented as an independent Black nation. And this is what, we, this is, this ain't Garvey. This is the NAACP. This is the UNIA. This is the NAACP. I mean, so that vision of freedom that is articulated in Haiti, that is manifest through the actions there, that's reflected in the words and beliefs of people while they are enslaved, lingers and is reflected and held onto and held up well into uh, the turn of the 20th century. So there's my 20th century contribution. There, you made it to the 20th century. You made it to 1917. So at least, at least we got there. Um, well, th thank you, Hassan. <laughs> Let me see. Um, we, I'm going to ask our our host to maybe uh, get on and let us know if we have any questions which are not visible here. But um, the Katie yes. or yeah, Katie, is there anything that has come in? Yeah. Um, yes, we have a question um, for both panelists. After the Haitian Revolution, didn't it get quote unquote worse for enslaved folk? Their movement was more limited. They were afraid of them getting together to share ideas of freedom. So if you're talking about sort of what happens immediately following the uprising that becomes the Haitian Revolution, there's no question, right? That there's a massive crackdown. Um, that comes from um, the French government, right? Trying to put um, the rebellion down. And so there is a wave of brutality um, that takes place from French colonists um, against, um, you know, folks who are actually living in, white folks who are actually living in Saint-Domingue, right? Try to un unleash a reign of terror um, against the um, enslaved population in Saint-Domingue. And um, certainly the military, right? The French military arrives from France um, in an effort to also uh, try to put down the rebellion. So the brutality that takes place um, in response to um, the uprising is, is incredibly brutal. Um, it looks like you're asking a follow-up question here. Oh, in the United States, yes. Yeah. So absolutely, um, within the boundaries of the United States, again, initially the founding fathers um, are looking at what becomes the Haitian Revolution as just sort of another uprising that's happening in the Caribbean. So they're concerned about it, they're keeping an eye on it, but they're not imagining that it's gonna become anything in particular. But once the, um, once the, the revolt, the uprising becomes a full scale rebellion and that eventually blossoms into this sort of unstoppable um, force for freedom, Yes, politicians, um, certainly on the national level, but also on the local level, um, become extremely concerned, right? We see the ramping up of um, slave patrols. We see the strengthening of the slave codes. We see um, a sort of a wave of repression take place, again, to try to con control what they imagine as this contagion um, of rebellion that they fear is going to take place across the United States. And as I tell people all the time, they're not entirely wrong, <laughs> right, to fear that, right? There's no question um, that enslaved people in the boundaries of the United States and in places like Spanish Louisiana um, and French Louisiana become deeply inspired by um, the Haitian Revolution and start using it to um, plan other types of things, right? The, um, the Pancoupe Rebellion, the German Coast Rebellion, um, Gabriel Prosser's conspiracy, Denmark Vesey's conspiracy, and in fact, historians now believe that the Southampton County um, Rebellion, also known as Nat Turner's Rebellion, um, was at least in, to some degree influenced or inspired by the Haitian Revolution. So, you know, politicians are not entirely wrong, right, that the Haitian Revolution could be used as a source of inspiration for enslaved people in the United States. Um, and it does lead to um, a wave of, of repression, particularly after uprisings like um, Gabriel's um, conspiracy come to light. We have a question from Imani Price um, and from, uh, from another person, I don't see the name, but I'll ask them both. And 
So one is when uprisings happened in the US, this is from Imani Price, how did the founding fathers justify their response to enslaved people? And I'm going to ask the other one as well, just so we can have it out there. Uh, are there any 19th century cultural celebrations amongst Black American society that reflects the admiration of the Haitian people? I think that was Matt Reeves. Well, Matt, you should, Matt a, should answer that. Matt, <laughs> Matt, <laughs> Matt can answer that better than, than anybody on here. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll say we have to remember that democracy may be the cornerstone of America, but violence is the cornerstone of slavery, right? So, so anytime you have um, African American insurrections, people, I mean, whether it's in the 80s or the United States, as, as you were mentioning, you know, what is the Stono Rebellion? You see the, 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 the violent crackdown, Southampton, Nat Turner, the violent crackdown, and also reimagining, rethinking. Uh, of laws, right? So it's the it's the violent suppression. You know, if for anybody who may have possibly had a hand in it, so you're going to have that you're going to have that immediate violent response, and then it's about okay, we got to do better to limit these freedoms. So you know, it, it's the founders, the framers, you know, they they don't feel an obligation at all to 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 justify their actions to enslave people because enslaved people aren't people, right? They're property. They're not to be negotiated with, right? Now, of course, there's always negotiations in the personal politics and the power dynamics on an individual level. Yes, I understand. But when it comes to the group as a whole, no, 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 no. We're not going to negotiate. You bend to our will. And if that means that we have to use extreme violence and force and torture, then we will. Uh, and so, the, uh, as you said, James, at the very beginning, like that violence, the use of violence is fundamentally anti-democratic. So here we're trying to build a democratic state, but you're so willing to use state-sanctioned violence. I mean, that we have to reconcile that, right? That's for us to reconcile. They were okay with it. They ain't had a problem. They're like, this is the way it works. In order to maintain institutional slavery, we got to use violence, period. They were okay. They made it work for them. We, looking back, need to, need to understand what does that say about them, who they were, and what their visions of freedom and democracy were at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just one thing I want to add to that, because I've been thinking about this a lot recently that, you know, one of the things that fascinates me about the governmental response um, to all of the various forms of protest that Black activists um, and just regular Black folk, right, um, Black thinkers are using during this time, whether it be running away, whether it be, you know, rebellion, but also whether it be um, court cases or petitions, all the forms of agitation that Black people are using to try to challenge um, governmental policy and individual political leaders, the repression, the, the crackdown that comes from the government is about like as un-Madisonian, <laughs> right? Um, as an idea could be. One of the things that I keep coming back to, um, because we tend to think a lot about Madison relative to um, certainly, obviously, the Constitution, but also the Bill of Rights, and again, in particular, a couple of the amendments that he felt most passionate about, the first and the fifth. Um, but what we don't tend to talk as much about is his vehement opposition to the Aliens and Sedition Acts that were passed in 1798. Um, for those who are not familiar, they, they come about at a time when um, the United States government is concerned that a conflict with the French um, is going to emerge. And so the Sedition Act in particular um, was passed essentially making it a crime for anyone to speak negatively about a politician um, or to speak negatively about the United States or about the government out of fear that it would bring disrepute um, on the United States. Madison was strongly opposed to the Sedition Act in 1798. First and foremost, because he believed that fundamental power and what he would have thought of as like absolute sovereignty rested in the hands of the people, not in the hands of the government. And so interestingly, he believed that no one was above critique, right? And again, this is tied to his commitment to the to freedom of speech and the First Amendment, right? That everyone has a right to express 
political ideas and to express political discontent. And even when he was president, right, when he was getting a lot of blowback, especially in the War of 1812, he still strongly stood by the idea that no one is above critique, including himself as president at the time, right? Um, and so what's really fascinating about this is that the uh, attempts by the government to put down political expression, to try to silence people who are articulating a different political viewpoint is fundamentally un-Madisonian, <laughs> right? Um, because even when someone disagreed with him, or criticized him, he believed that every political expression ought to be heard. That's a great point. And um, I, I, I often uh, try to draw a parallels between um, what you just said, Madisonian's clear independence of thought and, and, and belief in the democratic principle, wherever it takes you. And, and kind of where we are today and what we're doing in particular at Montpelier. Um, but it's, it, it really kind of underscores, going back to the theme of our discussion today, how Black Americans helped shape democracy throughout history. It, it underscores how powerful of an idea that was unleashed, right? At the end of the uh, 18th century and the various different ways that it, uh, it played out on the ground across continents. And um, one thing that, that fascinates me about what both of you have said is that um, the struggle by Black Americans to reaffirm the Madisonian principles was not confined between American society and Black Americans. What it did was it expanded the circle of, of democracy for the entire society. And I wonder if, if, if either of you wants to talk about that as we, as we end uh, our conversation, uh, uh, because we are a little bit over time. Well, that sounds I, like a you question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll try to follow and, and try to be brief. And, and if you don't like the question, answer, a, answer a different one. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a great it's a, question. It is a great question because it actually speaks to what I think is the the, the, the critical, fundamental, the core contribution of African Americans and their struggle for freedom in this land that becomes the United States to the broader American journey, American experience. And that is the expansion of democracy. That's what, that's what we as Black folk have brought to the table. That's what our struggle has always been about. Now, there are elements within the community who have always been like, look, damn democracy here, we got to go. Like we, there, there is never, there will never be enough freedom here for us to live as full human beings. That, that's, that's been part of the tension and discussion and debate within the African-American community. But aside from that, within that, you've had, the, the, I, I, would, I would probably argue to say that the, what the result has been in this struggle for acquiring more basic civil rights, as long as you're in the context of the United States and more fundamental human rights, is that the victories have led to an expansion of democracy for all people, right? And, 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 and not just like, hey, well, that's the Civil War. No, no, no. The Civil War, the Reconstruction Acts, the 19th Amendment, the 1965 Civil Rights Act, the 1965 New Immigration Act. I mean, all of these things have expanded. And now even, you know, when we, when we move into sort of the, 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 the post-federal, uh, the major civil rights legislation, when you still had the court, right, that hadn't lost its mind and was still believed in people over property, right, the expansion of, of, of human rights, right, to include LGBTQ folk and the like, right? So what we have seen is that all that stems from the willingness of African-Americans to sacrifice at the cost of their lives mm -hmm. to not only secure more basic civil rights and human rights for themselves, but for everybody around them, for yeah. this nation as a whole. And in the end, that becomes that that makes America what it is, right? Because it's it's it this what we live in a nation today that Madison and Jeff, Jefferson could not even have conceived of. In fact, we're living their nightmare. This kind of expansive democracy, theoretically, yeah, but not in the practical application. And why is that? Because Black folk had a a greater vision of what freedom ought to look like 
that if you incorporate them, then that leads to something that will look fundamentally different. And I would argue fundamentally better. Great. Um, Leslie, do you want to follow up on that one? No. <laughs> there, there is no follow-up to that that's why as soon as you said that I was like that's a you question because <laughs> I knew no one was going to be able to say it better than than my friend Hassan <laughs> it's been a real uh pleasure seeing the reunion of the two of you um who have been on panels many many times before and uh and it's it's great I see why you're such a good duo in this uh, in in this history uh debate world. So I want to thank uh, my panelists, thank uh, the guests, the audience. Thank you for staying over a little. I hope that it was not uh, too long for you and that you enjoyed and learned something tonight. I certainly did. We um, invite views from all outlooks at Montpelier, and we will have many, many more panel discussions about Madisonian principles, the history of America, and we invite you to come back and uh, and to continue uh, learning from our discussions as we all do uh, ourselves. So thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thanks, James. See you, Leslie. Thanks. Good to see you. You too.